Good morning and welcome to worship this morning in the first ever joint Advent service with National City Christian Church and the First Baptist Church of the City of Washington, D.C. I'm Amy Butler. I'm the Interim Senior Minister at National City and I'm here with Pastor Julie, who is the pastor of First Baptist Church. Julie, welcome to this beautiful sanctuary. It's so lovely to have you here. Thank you so much. I am thrilled to be here. Uh, our congregation ha has been so excited about doing this together um, in a year that's been difficult on many levels. This feels like a lovely way to bring 2020 to a close for us. Yes, and I, I know from the work that we've done together over these weeks in preparation that folks who are with us in worship will feel the warmth of both of these communities and um, just be included in the community that extends beyond these walls. Absolutely. Uh, and, and really, there is a, a lovely symmetry to our sharing Advent together this way because um, our, our two churches have a, a history together that goes back at least 70 years. Back in the 1950s and 60s, uh, the National City pastor, George Davis, and the First Baptist pastor, Ed Pruden, were part of a pastor's get-together group. They would meet once a month and, and discuss uh, articles and books and um, also uh, have dinner together. And so it, it just feels lovely to be able to share this time together. And Pastor Julie, for the decades of my career, I've had the opportunity to see you as a mentor and uh, an example for me and um, a colleague whom I greatly admire, but never had the opportunity to work directly with you. So what a gift. It feels like a gift to me. And of course, I have known of you. And even when um, I was in Waco and had heard your name and then, of course, have followed your beautiful ministry all along the way. This feels like a real gift to me as well. Wonderful. Friends, we're going to have a lot of fun in the work that our staffs did collaboratively in preparation for Advent. We took pieces from both traditions and wove them together. So you'll experience a little bit of difference uh, in our worship over the next four weeks. For example, here at National City, we celebrate communion every Sunday. So we'll be doing that. Um, First Baptist has brought in an amazing uh, um, musical contribution to our services and then also this amazing practice of after the sermon to enter into some moments of deep silence. So get ready for some interesting and diverse ways of worshiping, which I think is really fun. I think it's going to be lovely. Our people are ready. Uh, you know, Advent feels like a great time to experience an adventure, uh, going somewhere maybe that you've not experienced before, although I think there are going to be plenty of um, familiar tones all through Advent together. It's going to be a beautiful journey. Our theme this Advent is Awake, Awake, with the idea that Advent begins in the dark and we are waiting for the light to come. Uh, this first Sunday is the Sunday of Hope. And so I get to ask you the hard question, Pastor Julie, where are you finding hope in these moments? Yeah. You know, at the end of 2020, um, Hope Sunday almost feels a little bit ironic. Um, I struggled with this question. Uh, and so, uh, you know, in the run up to, uh, to today, to Hope Sunday, I found myself thinking uh, a lot about the, the difference between faith and hope. And um, it seems to me that, that faith uh, looks at the present moment and says, God, I trust you, I trust that you're here, I believe that you care. Um, but when you've seen one painful situation too many and uh, you, uh, you know that something has to change, but you don't see any evidence right in front of you that things are gonna be changing soon. That's where hope kicks in. Um, I, I love what, what somebody once said, um, that, that hope is faith 
with its walking shoes on. Uh, hope fixes its sight on that promise out there on a far off horizon and walks toward it step by step. So um, that seems about right to me this year and I'm looking forward to uh, making this, this journey together. I was thinking that maybe this year more than any other Advent Sunday of Hope, we have an opportunity to understand it with a tangible sense that we haven't before. Um, I'm thinking about COVID and how it's raging and how so many people are struggling with uncertainty and grief. And we can enter into the words of the prophet who is waiting for God to break open the heavens and come down. I'm finding hope in our worshiping together and in this collaborative process of creating Advent with two congregations. That right there is a symbol of hope and all that we can be together as we wait for the coming of God's gift of light to the world. Friends, welcome to worship this morning. We are so very glad you're here. Hello, my name is Frederica and Tawana Lloyd. And today we light the first candle on the Advent wreath. We light the candle of hope. Let it remind us of the hope and promise of God.
On our first Sunday of Advent, I wanted to talk to the children about hope. Hope is something that we, it's kind of word like love that we toss around a lot. I hope that I get this for Christmas. I hope my parents don't make me do this. Let me tell you about two occasions in my life that I hoped for. I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina, near the beach. So I saw two snows my whole entire childhood growing up. The first was when I was in first grade and we had seven inches of snow. Now I know for you children around here, that doesn't seem like a lot of snow, but for a child who was seven years old in Charleston, that was a lot of snow. And I can remember that night before I went to bed because it was one of those late night snowfalls that happened in the middle of the night. So when I went to bed at eight o'clock, there was nothing, nothing. And I just prayed and I hoped, I hoped that there would be snow when I woke up. And don't you know it, when I woke that next morning, mom woke me up with a big, get up, Stephen, get up. And I got up and I saw snow everywhere. My hope had been fulfilled. Well, the second is kind of like it. Maybe some of you children can relate. I, I was a little bit older, maybe 11 or 12, I believe. And I was into stock car racing. That was what my brother and I loved to do. We loved to race our bikes and race our dirt buggies around the block. So this one Christmas, there was this racetrack and it had just come out and it had like this little thing that you could control the cars and they would switch lanes. Well, back in the late seventies, that was big. That was a big thing that the cars could switch lanes on this little track that went around your bedroom. And I kept praying and hoping. And I told all my friends, I hope I get that racetrack for Christmas. Well, Santa was good to me. I got that slotless, I remember what it was called, slotless racing. And the track that dad built went all the way around the living room. But friends, I want to tell you about hope this morning. That doesn't disappoint because we don't always get what Santa is going to promise us to bring. We don't always get the big snowfalls. We don't always make all A's in school. But the hope of Jesus Christ, the hope that we've gathered during this Sunday and the next three Sundays is one that will never disappoint. And so during the church year, we get ready. We start preparing our hearts and preparing in worship for the hope that is ours to come on December 25th. Will you hope with me? This scripture is taken from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 64, verses 1 to 9. Hear now these inspired words. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil to make known your name to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you, who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O oh Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. 
Now consider, we are all your people. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's say our prayers together this morning. God of hope, in a year with so much waiting, of remembering, remembering before times, remembering hugs and handshakes, remembering the singing and the people watching in cafes, we begin another season of waiting. We begin the season of waiting for our world to change again. We've heard the news of a potential remedy just months away available to all. And so we wait again. We make room for the Messiah who came to this earth vulnerable and a refugee. Perhaps it was for himself to remember our story as humans. Or perhaps it was for him to remind us of the story of the vulnerable Christ. Perhaps it was for him to command of us to do to the least of these. And remember that what we do for the least of these is what we do for Jesus. Forgive us when what we do and what we ignore is the image of Christ in our neighbors. Forgive us when we ignore the image of Christ in our homeless neighbor, in our LGBTQ neighbor, in our black neighbor, brown neighbor, immigrant neighbor, elderly neighbor, working class neighbor, our disabled neighbor. Help us to be kingdom people in these days, Creator God. Help us to remember that we are co-laborers of liberation. And when we are tempted to create idols of the empire, may we remember the words of the prophets who spoke of a liberator. May we remember the words of the mother Mary who spoke of someone who would fill the hungry with good things and who would wipe away the greedy. And today we not only remember the actions of Jesus, but we remember his words. We remember the words that he taught his disciples to pray, saying boldly, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
This morning's scripture reading is taken from the 13th chapter of Mark, beginning at the 24th verse. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the full winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branches becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away before all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. But of that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or at cock crow or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Welcome friends to the season of Advent, the first day of the new church year. You might be able to tell something has changed, what with the change of color of the minister's stoles, all of the candle lighting and the music that indicates it's that certain time of year, Advent. In the church calendar, we don't begin the year with confetti and champagne. Instead, it all starts with one little candle, lit in a kind of defiance to push back at the darkness around us. Along with the darkness, Advent also brings with it themes of absence, penitence, waiting. Happy New Year. If it feels strange, what with the world around us donning tinsel and blaring all I want for Christmas, you are not alone. Some of us Christians have been so annoyed over the years about the incongruous somberness of the season of Advent that we've watered it down and in some cases eliminated it altogether. It does seem a little strange, I'll admit, that after several days of Thanksgiving celebration, consumption of copious amounts of food, reflections on gratitude, and warm feelings of fullness and satisfaction, that we would come here to worship and be drawn back to the stark reality of our human experience. That our lives are not all made up of perfect families who always have too much to eat and warm places in which to feel satisfied and happy. That our world is not set to rights. In fact, we know maybe more than ever that there are cold and dark and broken places in our world. What is the future? We don't know. What kind of hope can we claim in the middle of such pain and brokenness? It is not altogether obvious. And so here we are on the first Sunday of the church year, the first Sunday of Advent. And today we light the very first candle on our Advent wreath, the candle of hope. We are looking for something anything to lift our hearts, to carry our spirits, to reassure us that what we see when we look around us is not the final word, that there's something on the horizon that's on its way, something that won't allow us to remain in the pain that we've created for ourselves, but instead that offers us the opportunity of something more. We're waiting waiting for the light of Christ to remind us that there is some hope for us after all. Perhaps then, Advent is 
the best place to start because it is in the darkness that we awake. To guide us in reflection this morning, we hear the words of an Israelite prophet, Isaiah. As you know, there is a book in our Bibles called Isaiah, but it is inaccurate to take the whole book as the composition of one person at one time. Scholars disagree, of course, about the details, but most would say there are three distinct parts of the book of Isaiah. Different prophetic takes on three different parts of Israelite history. Before the people are taken into Babylonian exile, while they are living in exile, and after they return home from exile to Jerusalem. Our passage today comes from the third portion of Isaiah, the part written after the Israelites finally return home to Jerusalem. And you would think the perspective of the prophet would be one of joy and exhilaration of people stuffed full with Thanksgiving dinner, happy to be back in the land that was promised them and looking forward to a merry holiday season ahead. The problem is that, like our reality, theirs was something a little different than what they'd imagined. After years of living in exile, finally they were released from the unjust domination of the Babylonian Empire and returned to their beloved Jerusalem to resume the life that they had known. All of a sudden that day had come, but things just were not exactly like the memories that had sustained them through all those years of exile. Well, they'd finally gotten what they wished for. They had everything they'd hoped for. Something was wrong. Hope seemed absent. God seemed absent. Here was the reality of their realized dream. Jerusalem was devastated. It was a veritable wasteland of a city, still rubble compared to its former glory. They'd returned to a society made up of former outcasts, the riffraff left behind when the upper classes had been exiled, people sharing their neighborhoods whom they never wanted to share neighborhood, neighborhoods with before. And the exiles were back with different cultural cu customs and food and clothing and music and even modifications to their religion. Everything was strange and strained. And all the dreams of recreating what they had lost turned quickly into a nightmare of readjustment where nothing seemed to fit anymore, where the utopia of cultural existence that kept their hopes alive all those years seemed to evaporate. And as the prophet looked around at the situation in which the Israelites found themselves, even he, Isaiah, messenger of the Lord, was beginning to feel desperate. All he could feel was the absence of God, and so he wailed, Oh, that you might tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would tremble before you. While he cried out to the heavens, shaking his fist and pleading for God to do something, anything, Isaiah the prophet was asking the people to join him in living their lives in anticipation. He wanted them to scan the darkness while they waited, to look, to look hard for a sign, for any sign, that hope that God was on the way. And it is from this perspective that the prophet is writing, from the perspective of what should have been happiness and fulfillment and dreams realized and the promised land recreated, but it wasn't. In the darkness of this new reality, hope seemed absent until, until they remembered that it's often in the darkness that we begin to wake up to all the possibilities of our lives. I recently heard an episode of Radio Lab that told the story of Alan Lungard and Emily Gassio. Two 21-year-old art students, they were living the dream in a loft in Brooklyn, studying art and basking in the glow of young love. They'd met at a party only nine months before and had, as Alan describes, a moment. On the program, he waxes poetic about Emily's iridescent eyes 
And when the interviewer says, so you knew in that moment that this was more than just a thing? Alan breaks in and says, oh yes, it was more than a thing. It was the thing. One day on her way to class, Emily was involved in a traffic accident. She was on her bike and was hit by a huge truck. She was in ICU clinging to life. Alan called Emily's parents to hurry to the city where all three of them kept vigil around Emily's bed, her parents splitting the daytime hours and Alan staying every night, all night long. For weeks, they waited for her to recover with few signs of hope. Finally, the doctors made their pronouncement. Emily was medically stable, but completely unresponsive. Against Alan's urgent insistence, her parents agreed she'd probably not get much better, so they made plans to transport her to a nursing home in their hometown where she would likely live the rest of her life. But Alan couldn't give up on a little shred of hope. In the middle of what seemed to be complete desolation, he insisted, I think she's in there. She just can't get out. You have to give her a chance. You have to give her a chance, he begged. Because Emily had sustained some hearing loss in childhood and worn hearing aids before the accident, and because the doctors thought she lost her vision as a result of the accident, Alan, in a desperate attempt to prove to the doctors that Emily might get better, tried something he'd heard about in the story of Helen Keller. He traced on her arm the words, I love you. Over and over, he traced the letters on her arm. And sure enough, she awoke. She responded. Alan had proof of what he'd hoped was true, but the doctors and Emily's parents still weren't sure, so Alan tried putting her hearing aids on and turning them on, and when that happened, she could finally hear and everything changed. Emily awoke and began to speak. How many of us are people who have more than we could ever imagine we might need, but still feel a sense of emptiness, of longing, of the absence of God this first Sunday in Advent. We might have a lot of stuff, but anyone with any little bit of sense will not be fooled for more than a minute by the shiny glitter and curling bows of our society. This year in particular, when our television screens have flashed with the real life suffering of people, this time not halfway around the world, but in our own backyards and in the streets and courtrooms of this country, in the ERs and ICUs of our hospitals and everywhere we turn. And this raw human suffering, despite the fact that these televisions are blaring from the richest country in the world, is only indicative of piles and piles of deeper pain carried like unbearable weights through this human existence we live. It turns out that even with all that we have, despair crowds in when we realize we cannot create communities that reflect God's justice and hope, when we cannot for the life of us even feel the presence of God some days. Like the prophet Isaiah, we long in the deepest parts of our souls to be delivered from this broken and hurting world we've created. Isaiah said, we have been in our sins such a long time. When shall we be saved? We do not long for more of the same, for more running around aimlessly, constructing and reconstructing unjust societies, accumulating things, wishing for a world totally different than the one we've created, lamenting the injustices of our lives and our world. We don't want that. What we want is to squint through the darkness and to see a little bit of light 
a little bit of hope. Like Isaiah, we want God to tear open the heavens and come down to answer our silence and penitence, to come into our darkness with the defiance of light, to come and save us. We want to awake to hope. So this Advent, look through the darkness, rub the sleep from your eyes, and awake to hope. Because if we barrel toward Christmas oblivious to the reality of our lives, bolstered by too much eggnog and running on adrenaline after late night shopping sprees, senses overwhelmed by too much sugar and too many jingle bells, well then, we might never stop long enough to remember how very much we need a savior. We have to pause and to wait. Advent invites us to come and sit in the darkness with only the flickering light of a few candles and even for just a while to take stock of our reality and remember our need for a savior. Today is the Advent Sunday of hope, lit by the light of just one candle. We begin this journey toward Christmas waiting for a sign, just a little sign, that what we see around us is not the final word. God is on his way, ready to be born in us again, to shape the reality in which we live into something promising and beautiful, something full and meaningful, to wake us up to the possibility of all that God hopes for the whole world. So today, light the candle along with me and watch as it pushes back the darkness very soon we will awake. Amen. It's the first Sunday of Advent, the Sunday of hope. And as we wait in the darkness for the light, we allow God's words to sink into our hearts and transform us. Would you join me in the silence? Welcome, friends, to the table that love has set for us on this first Sunday of Advent, Hope Sunday. 
In these days of separation and isolation, what a hopeful thing it is for our two congregations to join together even in this virtual way at the table of Christ. This table does not belong to First Baptist Church or to National City Christian Church, but to God who has created and is creating, who has come to us in Jesus, the Word made flesh, and who works in us and in others by the Spirit. So come to this table, you who bring much faith, you who feel as though you're scraping the bottom of the jar, you who come here often, and you for whom it's been a long time. Saints, cynics, believers, doubters, come to the table. It's Christ who invites us, and it's Christ who meets us here. And so now we remember how on the night when he was betrayed, Jesus gathered with those closest to him. And during the meal, he took bread. And after giving thanks to God for the bread, he broke it. And he said to them, this is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And he said to them, this cup is God's new covenant with you, sealed in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For indeed, friends, as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Take and eat. Amen. The season of Advent is the first season in the liturgical year of the church's calendar. It's like the moment right before the dawn. We're waiting, we're waiting for the light to come. And so what better way to begin the season of Advent than to stay awake waiting for hope. Today is the first Sunday of Advent, the Sunday of hope. And surely we are hoping for so many things. We're hoping for the healing of our country around this pandemic. We're hoping for the coming of the light as the seasons begin to change. We're hoping for a world that is healed and whole. But hoping doesn't mean just sitting and waiting. Hoping means putting our hands and our lives to the task of bringing about God's great hopes for this world. And we do that, of course, by cultivating generosity in our lives and by participating with joy and enthusiasm in the life of our communities of faith. What a gift it is to be together this Advent, National City Christian Church and the First Baptist Church of the City of Washington, D.C. So I want to encourage you today on the first Sunday of Advent to participate with hope in the life of your community by giving generously your tithes and offerings. At both congregations, you can give through your Tithely app. You can go on the church website or you, of course, can mail a check in to the church offices. We'll do that together as two congregations partnering in this season of Advent and in the work of God to heal the world. Friends, we're so glad that you joined us for this first Sunday of Advent. As our worship comes to a close, I invite you to join me in a few moments of silence and then to receive this blessing. And now on this Sunday of hope, open your hearts. Open your hearts to the hope of all that God can be in your life and in this world. 
And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Fount of life forever.